Welcome, everybody. My name is Tamar Friedman. On behalf of JFN, I want to welcome you today to the first of a three-part series and probably more as we, as we dive into different subject areas. Uh, the National Affinity Group of Jewish Poverty's series of briefings on poverty and the impact of COVID-19. We have a lot to, to learn and to talk about today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Dina Fuchs, who will frame the conversation and give some updates about the Affinity Group. Thank you, Dina. Thanks, Tamar, and thanks for all your work in organizing this. Um, it's really nice to see everybody. Um, and just wanted to, to uh, welcome you as well. I hope everyone's doing well, feeling healthy and, uh, and productive. Um, everyone's working really hard, and I just hope you're feeling good about all the work you're doing. Um, I want to just um, give a quick, uh, a, quick, a quick update on uh, the Poverty Affinity Group. Um, and um, I just didn't sort of to introduce it to some of you who may not be familiar with it. We're a hybrid group of funders and grant makers, central agency planners, direct service providers, and others who are dedicated to the human service sector. And I think it's important to acknowledge that there are many of us on this call who are really on the front lines. Um, Jessica, who will be joining us, just shared with us that this is the first day that she's not in the warehouse, um, which is not an experience that most of us are having. And I just, I think we need to say thank you to all of you who are really doing the work and, um, you know, you're the heroes. So thank you, Jessica, and thank you to everyone on this call who's there. Um, and, you know, we've been meeting as a, an affinity group for quite some time, maybe about a year or so. Um, it's been a sort of a slow ramp up, but we're a group who's been focusing on this issue for some time now. And it actually positioned us really well, unfortunately, for a crisis. And that we're already learning together, thinking together and sharing. And so we are a few steps ahead of um, where many, you know, funders and practitioners are finding themselves now dealing with the crisis. And I, you know, we, I guess maybe we should say we're a few steps ahead or at least we're not as far behind. Um, and so I think we should just need to, you know, push forward with this work. And I'm so gratified that um, we have so many people joining us here. Um, so our original goal with the Poverty Affinity Group was to come to up with the national agenda for Jewish poverty. Um, I think we have an interim goal now, right? And that's a national agenda for COVID-19. Um, and I think we've, we've sort of pivoted. That's the term of the century, I think, at this point. But we are thinking together about what we can do as a group, an affinity group, with all aligned goals and, um, you know, and thinking about what we can do for this crisis. Um, and again, because we've been doing this work together, we're, we're poised to think um, more quickly and more nimbly. So what have we, um, what have we done so far? Um, JFN, um, with, in partnership with the Affinity Group, has put together um, a catalog of um, sector needs and funder responses. It's up on our website. We have a COVID-19 resp uh, response hub. Um, so please feel free to check it out and please update it. Um, th needs are evolving and our work and your work is evolving. We want to make sure that we keep it as current, um, especially for the funding community who are looking for opportunities for investment. Um, we're holding these webinars. We had our first one about a month ago. We had many people who participated and the feedback that we got was that it was incredibly um, important that we had an overview conversation, but we really need to dig deep um, into, the, into the issue areas that we've been focusing on. And again, we've been doing this work for some time. We have been focusing on issues and today we're gonna focus on two of them around food insecurity and housing. Um, our next webinar, um, May 26th, is going to focus on jobs and, um, I'm sorry, mental health and older adults. And on June 9th, we're going to focus on um, jobs and the overall um, systems, uh, systems piece of human services. Um, our subgroups, you know, these deep dive groups are also focusing on, we just surveyed um, a group of practitioners and funders to think about, again, what the needs are and the opportunities are. And we're gonna be producing briefing papers for, for the funding community. Um, and we are pulling together a work group of funders um, who are thinking about where philanthropy can make um, a difference in this work. Um, and if anyone on this call would like to join, please let me know. Um, we hope to launch it within the next week or so. Um, so without a further ado, I really just want to share one observation that I'm seeing from the point, um, the JFN perspective. You now we are working on a COVID-19 response in all sectors of the Jewish community. And one thing that is becoming more and more apparent, I would say meeting after meeting and day after day, is that the human service agenda is now part of every agenda. And I think, you know, it's, it's a different conversation that's starting to evolve 
And um, we are in the position and we have the privilege to keep lifting that up and amplifying the needs um, and, and how it, it plays out for the entire community. Um, and so with that, I just want to uh, introduce Susan, um, who really needs no introduction, um, the master facilitator and really like devotee to this work. Um, and Susan, please, thank you. Thank you so much, Dina and Tamar and all of our guests. Um, thank you to the Jewish Funders Network for hosting us and the National Jewish Poverty Affinity Group for these timely uh, webinars. Um, so my name is Susan wolf -Dittkoff. I'm a senior advisor at the Bridge Band Group. Um, we work with uh, nonprofits and philanthropists, um, helping them think through um, scaling social uh, change. And at this time in particular, how to make sure that all of our uh, assets and activities are really focused on, um, on the people who are most vulnerable um, at this time. Um, so without further ado, I'd love to introduce this experienced panel. Um, they've been leaders in tackling poverty for decades and they are the perfect people to learn with right now, uh, especially at this time since we're all human services funders now. Uh, whatever we were before, we are also all human services funders now. Uh, so first, uh, Jeff Schoenfeld, who is a board member of the Jewish Funders Network and the immediate past president of UJ Federation of New York. Lisa Budlow, who's the Chief Executive Officer of High Baltimore, and Jessica Chait, who's the Managing Director of Food Programs at the Met Council on Jewish Poverty. So we'll cover a couple of things. Um, I asked them to prepare a couple of remarks, a couple of questions, just about their organizations, what they're doing, um, and really the biggest changes that they've seen uh, since COVID-19 has hit, um, and what they've seen that, that's unexpected, what they um, are doing now that they never thought they would be doing, um, or never done before, um, what they're learning and experimenting with, um, and just their insights and lessons. Um, and I think we'll hear both from the, the, the way we've organized this is that Jessica will focus really on food insecurity, um, although, as we'll see, um, it gets into a lot of other areas as well of vulnerable um, issues facing vulnerable populations. Um, Lisa will primarily focus on housing, but again, um, a lot of these issues are intertwined, so it may broaden. Um, and Jeff has been you know, such an experienced philanthropist and someone who's worked with hundreds, literally hundreds of, of generous donors over, again, decades. And um, what we're really hoping is that he can kind of give us a sense as to what he's seeing and how things are different from his perspective. Um, so we will dive in. I will just say one other brief thing, which is that we'll be collecting questions in the chat. Um, we'll probably start at the bottom of the hour on that. So please do chat in some questions and we will pull them out. Um, and then on a final note, I just, I do want to acknowledge, I always try to do this, that, you know, while this panel does have some important um, characteristics of diversity, which is terrific, um, it's also true that we don't have um, Jews of color represented today on this panel. And also that the experience really does skew towards Northeast, uh, East Coast larger cities. Um, and I just wanted to say that so that people understood where this is coming from. It doesn't mean that every webinar will be like that. The um, ones that we're um, actively soliciting have different representations, but I did just want to acknowledge that um, when we start. So if we can dive in, Jessica, if we can start with you, um, please for the next you know five, seven minutes, give us a sense of um, Met Council, give us a sense of what you've seen that's changed um, since COVID-19 has hit and, um, and what you're learning, what you're experiencing. Great, thank you. And uh, let me just also echo everyone, uh, you know, what everyone said before, my thanks, uh, not, over, not only to Jewish Funders Network, but there are so many good friends and funders um, on this call and people who have, um, I've worked with and um, really have deep, um, friendships with that really feel like they're supporting us out in the work every day. Um, so thank you. Um, I'm just going to start with a few framing comments um, because I know we have funders from around the country uh, who may be less familiar with, you know, the, the experience of New York, um, the numbers in New York. And so while we're very big and so our numbers are big, um, you know, I do think it's worth uh, kicking off from that perspective which is to say that um, in a UJ Federation funded study in 2011, uh, we learned that there were more than 50, 560,000 people living in Jewish households who were considered um, poor. And so these are people who are resources, UJA, Met Council, um, and so many others have been really focused on helping to sustain and support in kind of normal times. Um, and I actually joined Met Council uh, about 20 months ago after having worked at UJ Federation of New York for a decade 
um, to help Met Council really think about new strategies around food insecurity that could help us expand our work and do even more to support um, these people. And so as we look, um, and we could go deeper into the statistics or I'm happy to share them with you at any point, um, but the reality is that my council you know, was, was really founded 40 years ago to be on the front lines and to be uh, a source of support and also really an advocate for these people, um, people throughout our community who are chronically impoverished or honestly situationally impoverished um, and find themselves um, with you know, tremendous need um, that's different and, and specific um, to the Jewish community. So Met Council does more than food. I'll just hit on this quickly. We do affordable housing, we do crisis intervention, family violence services, benefit access. We do home repairs for low income seniors. And then of course we do our kosher food distribution, uh, which I have the great pleasure um, to oversee. And historically, we did that out of our warehouse, which many of you have visited. Um, and if you have in your city, or if you're familiar in New York with Food Bank for New York, or City Harvest, Met Council not only partners with those organizations, but we are essentially a peer of them operating as a kosher food bank. And so all of the food that comes into our warehouse is kosher. And then we use our trucks and our routing staff, and again, very similar to any other food bank model that you would be familiar with, um, to support a network of historically, or most recently, 40 food pantries, which are really embedded throughout the five boroughs and there as a source of um, food, but also wraparound services and support um, for people who need it. Our pantries are, of course, open for ever to everyone. So we have people of all backgrounds, and regardless if they need kosher food, they can be served by us, uh, but we are in communities where there's predominantly a kosher need um, so that we can make sure that, whereas if you don't need kosher food, Luckily, this city and many others have a wide network of um, food pantries that you can go into and get support. But if you need kosher food, we wanna make sure that um, people have that outlet and, and you know, a way to get the help that they need. So, um, and I, I wanna move into really what we are doing now, but I do wanna say that last year we moved 7.2 million pounds of food. It was already a 20% increase over the year before. Um, in October of 2019, we opened our 40th food pantry with Hebrew Educational Society in Canarsie, um, which many of our parents or grandparents lived in Canarsie. Uh, there's still Jews there, there's still a kosher food need, uh, but it also has the largest citywide meal gap in the city, um, which means that there are people of all backgrounds who really need our support in that location. Um, we also support our network through you know, capacity building and we help them get refrigerators and trucks and all the things, the volunteers, all the staffing that they need. Um, but most of the 40 are operating independently. We're just there to be a source of support. And as we noted, most importantly, provide them the food that they need. Um, on average, on an average month, December of 2019, for example, we served 60,000, it was like 62,000 people through that network of 40 pantries. Um, and as we lead into the conversation about COVID, I can assure you that those numbers are growing um, very, very rapidly. So that's sort of big picture. Again, happy to talk to anybody about what our operations look like. Um, again, I was hired to really help um, um, grow and scale the network to make sure that we were meeting all of the unmet food need, which uh, UJ also did a study on that. And we really identified that there were um, another 30,000 households in the Jewish community that weren't having their food needs met. So thankfully, we had already really begun that process of thinking about what does scaling look like um, under, <laughs> under normal times, and we are no longer in normal times, but we had thankfully begun that work. Um, and um, sort of what Dina was saying, that because we had done that work, we are you know, able, well positioned, really leading with our front foot to be able to respond in this crisis. Um, so, you know, COVID has um, turned all of our lives upside down, personally, professionally, organizationally. Um, we really recognized that COVID was descending upon New York City at the same time that we were gearing up for our Passover holiday distributions. So with the recognition that a lot of people need emergency kosher food throughout the year, we know that Passover is a very expensive holiday. Kosher for Passover food is more expensive. And so people who would normally um, not need help, not need assistance, do come out and need assistance at that time. Um, and we actually scale our distributions pretty significantly from 40 monthly sites to last year we did 130 sites before Passover reaching over 180,000 people during that period. 
this was happening this year. We were planning for this at the same time that COVID was hitting. And we knew we had to not only ramp up our distributions, but also really invest in new models, new ways. Um, we didn't know what it meant when we heard the city might shut down. What did that mean? Were we going to be able to continue our operations? There was really a lot of questions for us. Uh, now, obviously, we know a lot more about how to operate in these conditions, but at the time, um, it was really uh, a, almost like a, a sprint to figure out how we could move as much food as quickly as we could. In the end, not only were we deemed, obviously, an essential business, and of course, our operations have continued essentially six days a week, and we've opened a second warehouse um, to help meet the ongoing demand, um, but we... It, you know, we did dramatically ramp up. We actually served almost 170 sites during that period. And what we've seen is that a lot of those sites will continue to be in operation during this COVID period because people who are either um, needing sources of support very locally where they are because they're not traveling or alternatively are facing a new economic reality as a result of the job loss are turning to the place that they most recently went for help. And so those sites are that. Am I seeing, do I have to wrap up, Susan? Yeah, okay. So um, I just wanna highlight very quickly because I do wanna hit on a few strategies we're using, um, which is that we are now doing home deliveries for Holocaust survivors in partnership with Uber. I mentioned we're working out of a second warehouse. We're partnering with the city to ensure that anyone who needs food can call the city, request food through Get Food, and if they need a kosher option, Met Council is providing over 5,000 boxes a week um, to ensure that the city can affirmatively say yes to all of those requests. Um, and we are just looking to grow and scale in every way possible to help ensure that New Yorkers who have a kosher food need have those needs being met. My goodness, Jessica. I mean, the need and the numbers are just staggering. They're, they're, they're staggering. So thank you for sharing those. We'll get into yeah. more about um, the <clears throat> response um, in the next segment, but, uh, but thank you for that. Sure. that was a great, great way to kick off. Um, Lisa, if I can turn to you just to give us a quick sense of, of the organization and then really how things have changed and what you've been experimenting with um, over the last number of months. Sure. <clears throat> thank you so much. Thanks very much for the opportunity um, to speak on this really important topic. Um, I'm Lisa Budlow. I'm the CEO of CHI in Baltimore. CHI is a Comprehensive Housing Assistance, Inc. Um, we are um, a, uh, a community-based organization located in Northwest Baltimore. Um, our mission is to strengthen neighborhoods that have a connection to Jewish Baltimore. Uh, it's really important to us to state our mission that way because um, we, it's, we're a bit unique in the sense that we are place-based. Um, so we work where there is um, a neighborhood with a connection to um, Jewish history, a Jewish population, Jewish institutions, um, and there where we are, we serve broadly. So um, it's really important to what we do and how we do it that um, we provide, the services we provide, we provide um, for the general population without regard to um, whether our clients are Jewish or non-Jewish. And we feel like that creates sort of a unifying effect where um, we're really just kind of serving broadly. And it's um, very much about bringing our Jewish values into kind of like the why and the how of what we do. Um, we do what we do basically through housing and through community development. Um, we own 15 affordable senior apartment buildings that house 1,600 low-income seniors. Um, we have some other um, uh, portions of our portfolio that um, are different kinds of housing, but um, affordable senior housing really is the lion's share of what we do. Um, we have our community-based services. We serve homeowners. We do home ownership counseling, foreclosure prevention. We provide loans. And we have a large part of our community-based services focused on older adults who are aging in the community. Um, so we're providing socialization, transportation, home repair. We uh, have a senior center that um, has about a thousand members. It's been become extremely important um, in, in our COVID response, as I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so so we're, you know, we're serving um, throughout the community in large numbers. And you know, the question is what has changed? So much has changed, right? So much of what we have done in the past is about socialization, it's about combating isolation, it's about bringing people together. So all of that, you know, traditional socialization has changed. 
Um, we have a village that has a large monthly gathering, so that had to stop. Our senior center, of course, was shut down by the governor right on day one. Um, so all of that, uh, the doors were closed and all of those programs stopped. We have community-based meals programs um, in our in our housing um, buildings. There's lots of activities that are happening. You know, a big part of what we do is not just provide housing, but actually create an atmosphere that's a healthy um, and connected place for people to age. So um, that all got turned on its head and we had to figure out how to do what we do in just a completely different way. So you can't get rid of the mission, you just need to sort of, you know, find a different methodology to get there. Um, so um, because of the large number of vulnerable adults living in our affordable um, properties, our attention went straight there um, and how are we going to navigate to keep our seniors safe, um, given there is especially their, you know, um, extra vulnerability. So they're low income seniors. They have on average more chronic conditions um, than their peers who are not low income seniors. Um, and they're living in apartment buildings, so living in close quarters. Um, the additional challenge is that we, we do have one property that's in assisted living. This was almost the easier part of things because the governor came in and said, close the doors, you know, wrap your residents in a bubble and they're going to be okay. And thank goodness they have been okay. Um, but the independent seniors, this is their home. Um, and, and we're really not typically in the business of um, creating a whole bunch of rules. They, they, they live there and that's their house. And so they can come and go as they please. And the truth of the matter is, even in the case of emergency, um, we knew that our seniors could go out and go to a party and there really wasn't going to be that much we could do about it. Um, and so we had to um, really be, be very smart about our methodology um, in, in order to work in partnership with the seniors so that um, we could create an atmosphere of safety and compliance in the buildings. So the buildings are not staffed 24-7, um, and so that, that's just another point of, of vulnerability really for us is that we couldn't do this alone. So we knew what was important, um, but we needed partnership with the residents in order to bring it into reality. Um, an additional uh, uh, challenge for us is that guidance did not come out early on. Um, and so what uh, really we relied on other partners and uh, in collaboration, Leading Age um, is, a, is a, a national group that pulled um, housing providers together so that we could sort of work together to figure out best practices. And that was really a lifeline. Um, and, and ultimately guidance did come out. Um, and we, um, our experience, we had an early scare uh, very, very early on. And so we sort of ramped up our, um, our kind of safety restrictions. It didn't turn out to be what we thought it was, but once we were ramped up, we stayed there. And we're really grateful that that happened to us. So um, in one other interesting thing to think about when you're trying to keep independent seniors safe is that it, many of our buildings are HUD buildings. They're not all HUD buildings, but we do look to HUD for guidance. There was not a lot of guidance. They really were referring to CDC and local health departments. But one thing they did say is whatever you do, we know you want to keep your residents safe, be mindful of their civil rights. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was just a really um, good kind of reminder of that balance that we were striking. Mm -hmm. um, so in addition to, to, to ramping up and keeping them safe, we um, really had to worry about the connectivity. Um, and so the, um, what we did initially is just make a whole lot of phone calls. And it was remarkable how much people appreciated those phone calls. We we would get phone calls back, you know, you care about me so much, you're, you're checking in on me, how nice of you and kind of you to check in on me. And we're thinking like, of course, we're going to check in on you. Um, but it really, really makes a difference. And we were able to find out what their needs are, and then work through plans to to meet their needs. Interestingly, um, probably not that surprising, the, there are a lot of needs around food. So unlike Jessica and your group with so much experience, we had no experience providing food and we needed to ramp up to do it really quickly um, because we, you know, people not only uh, were having trouble affording food, but they were afraid to go out to the grocery store. So we needed to have that sort of common sense response to be able to ramp up and, um, and get food to people. One of the other um, critical elements is technology. Um, we knew this to be an issue before. 
We actually, through our senior center, um, a few years ago had established a technology hub because we know that there's all kinds of tools out there and people need to build the skills in order to be able to use them. And that, that is, is critical. We're grateful that we had that forethought um, because there are, there are ways to connect with technology, but there are people who don't have it, aren't familiar with it, uh, don't know how to use it, have an iPhone and only use it to make phone calls, that kind of thing. Um, so we have the staff and the capability to really be able to help people um, adapt to technology. I do want to, I'm getting my signal too, so I do want to just say one more thing, which is um, that we, we knew this to be true, but it's more true than ever. Uh, access to Wi-Fi is an absolutely critical need and um and and the not only you know getting a device and maybe getting a hotspot or that kind of thing but the real need is paying for you know monthly internet charges and um that that's just that's a big issue that we know needs to be solved that we haven't quite found that solution for yet great i mean what again a story of turning your entire business upside down which was all about connection all about creating those in-person communities and with distancing, with the restrictions, um, and and especially you know adding businesses you've never been in, it's um it's an incredible mm -hmm. time to do that while you are ramping up. Uh, so yeah, uh, thank you for that. Thank you. So Jeff, turning to you, um, just to shift a little bit, you know, I just want to hear a little bit about your thoughts about the how the donor landscape has changed for human services. I mean, you have been so embedded in this field and you care so much about it for such a long time. You know, just tell us a little bit about what it was like before COVID, if we can remember that far back, 117 days ago, I don't remember how long it was, um, but what people were talking about then, what it was like then and, and what it's like now and, and why, this, why this matters to you. Thanks for having me. Uh, I feel a great sense of gratitude to my, few, my, my fellow panelists who are on the front lines. I'm not on the front lines and um, you do beautiful work. Uh, let me just two seconds of introduction. Yes, I am a large funder uh, in the human service arena, largely through my federation, which is UJ Federation of New York. And I got there because I have seen the work. I have touched the work. I've had the privilege of helping plan for that work. And as a donor, there's something magical about there being a direct translation of philanthropy changing people's lives and you one definitely sees that in the human service arena. I come to the world of uh, being a donor with a, with a very specific lens, and I'll say that some people find this a little controversial, but if we just think about the world of Jewish philanthropy, I use the terminology of non-discretionary and discretionary grant making. We could all agree that the top of the pyramid for our community is probably taking care of Holocaust survivors in their final years, make sure they live in comfort, safety, and have dignity. Um, there are a lot of other areas that some people might call discretionary. We could get from today to tomorrow if that next Jewish education or Jewish identity program is not funded right now. That's not to say that identity education are important, of course they are, but I come to this world of funding at, with a lens of there are certain things that are non-discretionary, mostly in the human service space, and there are other things that become more discretionary. Now, we've come from a world, we've come from a long span of prosperity with one, what looks like now, temporary interruption in 08, 09, but it's been a 20, 30 year period of prosperity, which means that uh, a lot of things across this discretionary and non-discretionary space have been funded. There's been a lot of money for innovation and experimentation. Um, a lot of money has flown to those discretionary areas, education and identity over the past two to three decades. They're essentially were not funded uh, 30, 40 years ago when mostly it was all about human service. There's much better balance in our community today, but let me just say very clearly, the needs have never gone away. They've just become a bit invisible. What Jessica didn't say when she threw out that number of 560,000 Jews in New York living out or below the poverty line is that that's one out of three Jews. So out of about a million and a half Jews in New York 
one out of every three are poor, who would have thought that over this big sm span of prosperity, we'd still have numbers that look like that. The needs were enormous pre-COVID, the needs are even greater post-COVID. So what has changed? I would say the whole game has changed. There is clearly massive demand for human service support well beyond any largesse of government. It is not like in the last six weeks, eight weeks, government has waved its financial wand and that there are millions of dollars flowing to each of my partner partners on this call. A lot of the support that they're receiving to do the day in and day out work is through philanthropy. It is not necessarily through government. We need to remember that the US model is a different model than virtually every other country in the world. Government does not deliver direct service. Government relies on a network of not-for-profits to do that work for them. What was once a reimbursement rate of 98 cents in the dollar than 95 cents in the dollar is much closer to 85 cents in the dollar. Philanthropy is providing that vital, uh, filling that vital gap. So uh, a lot has changed and obviously the needs are much greater. I will also remind everyone that through philanthropic support, those entities that do receive government support are hugely leveraged. That exists under normal times. I can tell you that in my own community, in the last eight weeks, through our support, the institutions that we support have been able to access an additional $50 million of government support. That's not enough to, to fill the gap, but there's a leverage factor that goes on as well. One other point I'll make uh, before we maybe turn it over to questions or other, uh, uh, other comments is that over the span of the last 20 years, I would say a lot of particularly family foundations, but other donor categories have said, you know what, I used to give to a federation. I used to like that one-stop shopping and they would figure out where the need was and disperse the funds. I actually have infrastructure today, and so I'm gonna do it on my own, and I actually don't wanna disperse my funding. I want it to be more specific. Uh, I think there has been no better case for the role of a federation in a community than the last eight weeks. There is absolutely no way that any individual donor, no matter what your infrastructure is, can figure out where the needs are, can assess the size of that need, can get the money to where it's needed immediately, like some sort of centralized body, like a federation. So I think the case for a centralized model of distributing funds where and when needed uh, has never been stronger. And I'm really, really proud of the work that the entire federation system is doing at this moment. Uh, one final comment on how donors in my community have stepped up, which is probably an indication of how funding will pivot ahead. So far in the last eight weeks, we've coll collected an additional $20 million of funding from existing donors who not only provided their normal level of support, but an additional $20 million. So the Jewish funding community is gonna to have to go through some really hard thinking and have to decide whether this is a moment to pivot perhaps from what have been discretionary categories of funding to some of those non-discretionary funding areas, largely human service where the needs have skyrocketed and perhaps some of those other areas, new programs, innovation, experimentation, which are all important but might need to wait a year or two years or three years while this intense, unprecedented human service need is addressed. Thank you, Jeff. I mean, it's so powerful, again, because you bring that sort of experience and the lens from having had these conversations with people for such a long time. Um, let me just ask you one question, then I'll, one question for the, um, both Jessica and Lisa, and then we're gonna open it up because I'm already seeing questions in the chat. Quickly, Jeff, if you could sort of say the people who are now um, giving to human services causes who maybe weren't, 
um, without naming any names, what, how would they phrase why they're doing it? Like in their mind, what has, what has changed? What's, because what's they can, because largely because no matter what your income or wealth level, if you still have that roof over your head and you're not worried about where you're going to get your next meal, you feel like the, you have the ability to do more. And even if you have been financially harmed by all that's gone on, uh, people have reached in in beautiful, beautiful ways. And largely it's people saying to themselves, I'm one of the haves in a world of too many have nots. The have nots are growing in number and need. It's my moment. If not now, when? Good. Fantastic. And you really teed up something that um, hopefully Jessica and Lisa can address as well, which is sort of the role of government. Because what I hear a lot when we work with philanthropists is, well, isn't government taking care of that? I'm hearing trillion dollar stimulus packages and millions of dollars. in why, why do I have to give? By the way, the numbers are so big, I'm afraid to give. That's, uh, it won't make a difference. And, and isn't government supposed to be doing this? So talk a little bit from your perspectives about what is that unique role that private philanthropy plays that it has to play. Um, I think Jeff gave a good example of leverage, um, but just anything that you can um, think of that's really resonating uh, for people right now in terms of what the, what the case is for, for private philanthropy specifically. Um, either one of you, do, uh, Lisa, looks like you're about to, to go. Okay, sure. Um, so I want to um, just take a second and, and really echo what uh, Jeff said about the role of the Federation um, in this moment. Uh, we, we absolutely see that in Baltimore, uh, the, the Associated, our Federation has coordinated our response. It, it just, we're in sync and we're able to kind of move together and it provides that safety. And also while we're doing all of this frontline service, they are connecting with donors. So it's sort of like they're doing what they do best and we're doing what we do best. And that is just such a great way to function. Um, you know, so some of the things that, you know, uh, I think a lot of nonprofits are, are seeing the critical importance of diversifying their funding streams. It's always been important. It's like many things never been as important um, and so that ability to leverage government funding with, with um, private dollars, the needs are so big that there really isn't going to be one source that's going to meet these needs. We are going to need to have multiple funding streams. That is the only way to address the needs that we have. Um, one place that, um, that we have seen this is in um, some of our community-based housing um, uh, programs. So we have seen, we have housing counselors and this is always important in regular times. We are now going to see when moratoriums are lifted, um, a foreclosure crisis. Um, and we have over time steadily seen the government funding decrease for housing counseling and foreclosure prevention um, to the point where we used to have two counselors and we now have one. And we've known that this is important to build this back up. And this has really kind of thrust this in the limelight. And so there does, there is government funding, but it's not enough. It's never enough. There needs to be um, a, um, a, you know, a collaborative approach in order to get, you know, the funding needs met. We also see that in housing development. So, you know, we have these, these properties, we've developed them, and there's a whole lot of of um, funding that goes behind that is a combination of federal funding, uh, state funding, city funding, and private funding. And this is the kind of thing that is going to build our path to the future so that while we're addressing our immediate needs, we've got to be looking ahead as well. Um, and so I think it's really critical to have that um, collaboration. And I just wanna say one other thing, the, the flexibility of the um, of foundation world has been unbelievable and so appreciated. Uh, by people on the ground, and you're just never going to see quite that level of flexibility in government. It's really the private funders that know their agency partners so well that they're able to really allow them to pivot. Good. That's great. Jessica, tell us a little bit about um, how it's getting leveraged in, the, um, in, in your world. Sure. Well, it, I, I don't want to repeat, but Jeff and Lisa, the things you've mentioned, um, both in terms of, you know, the incomplete nature of a government, you know, reimbursement um, and, and, and all of the things that how that trickles out. But so I, I won't focus on that. But what I will add is that um, while COVID is becoming and has becoming a norm and we're learning how to deal in this environment, we know so much more now than we did, you know, March 6th, March 15th and those those initial weeks. Um, the reality is that 
every day presents new challenges, not just for um, us as an organization, our staff, but also obviously for the people on the ground, um, the people who need the food, as well as the agencies that might be closer to, like that can support them with Met Council's help. Um, and what I remember telling so vividly to, on a call with Alex Rothkahn standing outside of our warehouse um, back in March was like, and, and UJ, this led to UJ stepping up in a very significant way and we're so grateful. Um, but I remember saying like, we are doing, I know we are doing the work you want us to be doing. And even if there's not funding there today to do it, I'm not gonna not do this work because this is why we're here. Like this is, this is why you want a Met Council to be able to respond to these needs. And whether that was in my, you know, ensuring that pantries could stay open or literally whether making sure that my staff had the PPE and the protection they needed to be able to operate safely. And, um, and private funders allow us to have that, especially when we have that kind of relationship, to be able to say like, this is the work you want us to do. And maybe it looks different, but everything's different. The world is different and you want us to be responsive. And um, you know, government just doesn't often work that way. Um, and so I would say that um, knowing that we can um, do the work that like <laughs> Jewish Funders Network and everyone on this call wants to see happen. And that, you know, if you can trust that we have that, um, that and like we understand what you want and also um, that we are, you know, well positioned to do that, um, yeah. that trust is huge and that ability is, you know, unparalleled. I just will make one comment related to all of this is that in an ideal world, you'd start out in advance with this well-organized public-private partnership, because that's what it is, it, well, that, in, in a sense. It's a public-private partnership, but it's not well-organized and it's not proactive. It's almost entirely reactive. It has been and it continues to be, which makes it much less efficient than it needs to be. Yeah. Good. I have so many thoughts, but I want to um, move to the chat. There are a couple questions in already, and I would encourage others to um, bring some questions in. So Jessica, there was a question for you about your partnership using Uber for home delivered meals. Can you say a little bit about, about that? I know we've, we've only got about 14 minutes left in the, in the hour somehow. It flew by, sure. uh, but just tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so as Jeff, um, mentioned, you know, we are incredibly committed, uh, Met Council, really UJ Federation Network and all of our sister agencies in ensuring that the 30,000 Holocaust survivors who remain in New York um, have the support and services they need. And Met Council has always provided an important set of services to them, including food delivery um, and food packages. Um, but in this moment, particularly social distancing and recognizing that it is simply not safe for people over a certain age to be outside. And that is especially true of those who are made um, vulnerable by age or health outcomes, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And so we knew we had to do something and that um, we could use the existing clients that we have, use the existing resources of food and infrastructure that we had. And yes, we were changing our model and that usually we move food on pallets to pantries. You know, we had the ability to, to, to pivot and do, you know, basically home deliveries out of our warehouse. Um, Uber, as you can imagine, there are fewer people taking Ubers to the airport and taking rides around the city to go out. And so they were looking as a way to keep their drivers um, driving and um, approached us about a partnership. We were thrilled and they've actually gifted us um, 2,500 free rides. Um, that partnership, that, that free, the nature free is coming to an end. Um, but we're hopeful to be able to continue to work with them on a significantly discounted rate. Um, and then they use their Uber drivers. We're actually an Uber Eats location. So we've worked in through their whole back end technology. Uh, drivers show up in their mind. They don't know if they're coming to McDonald's or to Shake Shack or to Met Council Warehouse. They're just picking up a package to deliver it. Um, and it's been a really, obviously for us, a very cost effective way. Um, it's also taken a lot of the burdens out in terms of routing and um, all of the kind of back-end things that Uber can offer to make this a more streamlined process. Good. 
Fantastic. Um, it's just such a, one of those things that you need that flexible capital to be able to pivot and do that. Um, there's no Absolutely. long, long grant cycle for, for that. That's right. And to be clear, as generous as Uber is, and they really are, we had to quickly fold in philanthropic support to make this possible, right? There wasn't the, like, there, there are still costs. They're much more accessible given that Uber is donating so many of the rides. But this is, again, a role that philanthropy can play. And not only do we look to continue this, but we look to scale it. Great. Uh, there's a question for you, Lisa, about the calls to the seniors. Um, are they professionals or volunteers? And how is that sort of, how is that relationship um, sort of going? Yeah, so I mean, it's a great question and also really highlights the importance of flexibility in um, in our funding support. So um, we, we, they are our staff members. So um, you know, I mentioned in the beginning that we really had to pivot a lot of the, you know, the way we're delivering service. And so there's, we have people on staff that can't do their regular jobs. And we have two people who are our senior home repair technicians that go into seniors' homes. They can't do that right now. Um, and at the same time, you know, while we want to keep um, our, our staff, of course, and we have all these needs for connecting with our seniors. So we were able to redeploy the staff functions and have our own staff make these calls. And so not only is that just sort of an efficient way of doing things, but, you know, we find that um, it, it really kind of um, enhances that connection from the, from between the people that we serve and the agency. And the staff members are able to um, talk to clients about some of the other services that are available in our agency or sister agencies. And we can kind of really more effectively uh, connect people to services and resources that, that they may need. Um, so it's just, it's worked out really well, and we're you know again just so grateful for the trust that the, that our um, you know funding supporter have have put in us, so that we're able to to meet the need how it needs to be met you know in the in the given moment. That, that's great. Uh, we're short on time, but there are a couple of really good questions left, so I'm going to at least read them out, and maybe Jeff can tackle one of them. It says, should philanthropic money be spent lobbying government to raise its contribution to essential services? There's a question about whether the experience of aggressively addressing social isolation remotely has influenced our long-term service delivery thinking. So I know, Lisa, you have thoughts mm -hmm. on that one for sure, but um, do you want to tackle the, the first question, Jeff? Do you want to try to? I'd say if you don't have it, it's a little late to build it at the moment. That it's, it's, it's an intense resource commitment to build a government relations effort. You got to build the human connections. You got to be able to call the governor and call the mayor and pull those levers of power and money when you need them, which is now. So yes, long-term, uh, every community needs that, but uh, probably not the best place money is spent today. Good, really practical. Uh, so the, the question of um, how, how this has influenced your long-range service delivery thinking, I'm gonna add that to one more, um, which is to what extent um, do you reach out or serve clients who are non-Jewish? And I think you addressed this a little, but if you can just say a little more. Sure, so in terms of the role of technology and our thinking long-term, absolutely. Um, like I said before, we were originally thinking this way, but this has absolutely just propelled um, our thinking forward. And so, you know, our senior center, we, it's interesting because we had toyed with the idea of doing remote, you know, um, classes because you know, now everybody's home, but there's always been this issue. You know, somebody has, has a hip replacement and they're out for three months and they suspend their membership. And then we don't have connection to them and they don't have connection to us or their peers. And that's always been the way it is because I, honestly, our thinking was, well, we all come together in a place. So, you know, that whole, that thinking has completely shifted for everybody. And we realized that it is important to be able to reach people where they are. Interestingly, we have connected with people outside Baltimore. We're very, very place-based, but there's lots of people who used to live in Baltimore and now they live in Florida and they are tuning back in. They used to be members of the center. Well, they're back. Um, and so we've realized how important it is to be able to be flexible um, and, and really get those services out to people where they are. And, and that is absolutely going to continue going down that path. Um, I've forgotten what your other uh, question uh, was. Uh, clients who are not Jewish. Yeah, absolutely. So um, for us, I, I think, as I said before, that we are geographically focused. 
Um, so we're neighborhood based. So we're, we're, everything we do is about strengthening the neighborhood and the, the experience for people who are living in the neighborhoods that we serve. And so beyond that, 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 that those are our, our limitations or our boundaries. So beyond that, anybody there um, is, is who we serve. And we really think that it creates this kind of unified um, service delivery that builds uh, relationships one to the other in addition to between us and, and the neighbors we serve. Well, we are approaching the top of the hour. The gates are closing. We're all standing and hungry. And I, um, it just strikes me that we should try to wrap up. Um, I'm going to say a couple uh, housekeeping things. And then I want to give each of you a chance to kind of give your sort of takeaway message or one sort of headline, if you could leave people with one thought. Um, housekeeping. First of all, thank you. Thank you again to JFN and to the uh, National Affinity Group on Jewish Poverty. There are a tremendous number of resources online that you can access, um, and I hope you do, and there are ways to get involved in um, the Poverty Affinity Group going forward. Um, Dina um, is a good first point of contact if you're interested in um, having an issue that you're working on be discussed or you want to lead something. Um, the doors are open. Everyone is welcome. Agencies, funders, federations, um, just hangers on. Whoever you are, uh, you are welcome uh, if, you're, if you're interested in helping make things happen here. Um, the last thing I'll say is that the next, um, there are two more webinars coming up, um, which we hope you can attend. Um, Dina, I don't know if you want to say anything about that or if we can, do you want to say anything about the upcoming work? I'll just say May 26th, um, we're going to do a deep dive on mental health and older adults. And on June 9th, we're going to focus on jobs and um, overall systems. Great. And we're going to be planning more for after that. Great. Fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, so at, at Bridgepan, we've been working on a, a series of white papers here as well about racial equity in this time and managing in tough times and decision making and what to focus on and how to make faster decisions um, and advocacy and community responses. And I just have to say that the three We've got a dozen white papers or something on our website, but the three voices that you just heard are absolutely kind of in the top tier of the kinds of responses that we're, we're hearing and, and what we're thinking right now. So thank you for that. Um, just it's incredible work scaling quickly, um, innovatively. Um, and so just thank you. Thank you for, for doing it and for supporting it. All right, lightning round, last thoughts. Um, I will give you mine first, um, just to prime the pump a little bit. My, my headline from this hour, I think, is that you know, the problem is bigger than, than we think. It's worse than we think. It's not going away anytime soon. Um, and there's more opportunity um, to do good um, than maybe we think we can, um, and it's happening on the ground. So that's, it's very exciting. Um, let me start with you, Jessica. Do you have a, if you could leave people with one parting thought? Uh, I, I guess, I guess building off of what you just said, I have been amazed um, at how much we have been able to accomplish in the last two months. Um, we have just far exceeded what I think even our best advocates thought was possible. Uh, the need is absolutely tremendous, but as you're saying, so is the opportunity. And so um, we really have a very strong foundation that we're working from at Met Council, and I'm very confident in our ability to continue to expand and scale and, and innovate and um, be a part of the solution of a problem that honestly is well beyond a health crisis. This is now an economic crisis and one that uh, is gonna be with us for some time. Great, Lisa? Um, I think um, my, my big takeaway really is that community-based organizations, the value of them is the on the ground relationships. We are the d direct connect to people. Um, and I just think it has never been more important to show up for the people we serve, how they need us, where they need us, when they need us. Um, and, and if we do it and we do it right, then on the other side of this, we will have learned a whole lot about how to serve them better. And we will have deepened their trust in us. And I think we'll be even more effective in serving the community as, as we move forward. Wonderful, just doing the immediate need and setting it up for the long term. So thank mm -hmm. you for that. All right, Jeff, you get the last word. Um, maybe not an optimistic word, but uh, we spent a lot of time talking about support for individuals. Uh, we take it for granted that we have these institutions around us, JCCs, camps, human service organizations. Mm -hmm. the, the, all of these organizations are threatened with bankruptcy at the moment. 
That's how significant the area. Imagine the revenue shortfalls are going to happen for camps with no campers and all the expenses they have to have those camps available to open. Um, mm -hmm. the, the challenges are enormous. So let's not forget there are tremendous infrastructure needs to make sure that there is a Jewish community network tomorrow once we get through this storm. I, I, it's such a realistic word. It's something that's so important for us to hear. So thank you for ending us on it. Um, I think I'm, I'm hearing lean in from all three of you. Lean in. Uh, so thank you all so much. Um, Tamar, do you want to say anything or can we wrap up? Sure, we can wrap up. I wanted to thank you, Susan, for moderating so skillfully this incredible panel. I want to thank all the panelists for for joining us today and teaching us and especially for the work that you're doing every day in the community that's more important than than just being with us today so thank you and to every all the participants i we appreciate you logging on and learning with us we mentioned before that we're going to have two more in the next few weeks if you rsvp for today you automatically rsvp for the others so you'll be getting the login information the day before if you have any other questions for me in terms of more programs that are coming up or getting in touch with any of the panelists, you can reach me at tamar at jfunders.org and we look forward to learning with you again soon. Thank you and stay well everybody.